firewalls, as you may know, are really important security measures that you really want to have on your network. One of the nice things about Linux is it actually has a firewall built into it. Linux can then serve as a network firewall, or of course you could also have a firewall on your host and you could protect your local system. We're going to be working with IP tables and IP tables is the successor to IP chains. Linux has actually had a couple of different firewalls over the course of its life. We've been on IP tables now for several versions of the Linux kernel and that's what we're going to be working with now. We're going to call IP tables and I could do a minus I, which would be an insert rule that would allow me to insert a rule at a particular location in the rule set. What I want to do though, is I'm going to do an append. So that's going to be minus capital A and input is the chain that I want to add a rule to. I could use the output chain. I could use the forward chain. There are different chains, of course, you can use. We're going to be working with the input chain here. The first thing I want to do is match on an interface. So we're going to be looking for interface ETH0. Any messages or packets that come in on ETH0 are going to be inspected against this particular rule. I'm going to use minus S and 10.0.0.0 slash 8. So my source address is in the 10 block. Now I'm going to do a jump. That's what the minus J is. If we have matched on this rule, we are going to jump to a particular target action. And we'll get into some other things I can do. But the first thing I want to do is I actually want to log this. And now what I want to do once I've logged it is I want to drop it. I could also do IP tables minus a input. And again, I could say ETH zero minus S is 192.168.0.0 slash 16. I could do a minus J accept. And now I would be accepting anything from the 192.168 address space. I can do some additional things. IP tables gives you a lot of capabilities in terms of what you can match on. And you can see that we've got a number of targets here. We've got accept, drop, queue, return. We looked at log. This gives us the table that we're going to use. You can create your own custom tables. We've got filter, NAT, and mangle. These are built-in tables. And... We've got append, we can delete rules, insert rules, replace rules. We can list the rules that are there. And of course, we can also flush them out. Now, as I said, there's a lot of different capabilities that IP tables has. There's really a lot here and you can spend a lot of time really understanding all of the capabilities of IP tables. I can match on destination port and source port. I can match on protocol. I can do a lot of different things with IP tables. It really gives you a lot of useful capabilities. Here we've just created a couple of different rules for matching on some input targets and doing some different things with them. We've created a number of rules now. I need a way to manage the rules that we've got rather than having to recreate them every time or not be able to do anything once they're in memory. Fortunately, there are a number of ways that we can actually manage the rules in place and be able to flush them, be able to restore them, all of those different things. The first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at the rules that we've actually got so far. I can do a minus L, minus capital L actually lists the rules. There's some pieces of information that are actually missing from this list though. For example, I can see that I don't have an interface. When you've got a system that has multiple interfaces, being able to see which interface the rule actually applies to is really helpful. I'm going to append a minus V to the minus L. So we're going to get a verbose listing. And you can see now that we have added the interface here 
into the output for our rule listing. These are all of the rules that are in memory right now. Anytime I make a change to a rule, what I'm doing is I'm altering the in-memory copy of the rules list or the tables that are in place. I need a way now to save the rules that are there. What I can do is I can do service IP tables, which is going to call the IP table service script, and I can say save. That's going to save the firewall rules out, and now I can cat etsy sysconfig ip tables this is a output for the rules that have been saved you can see what we've got here is really it's a listing of the parameters to ip tables when the rules get created all you have to do is put an ip tables at the beginning of any of these lines and you've got the rule that would be created. So if I did IP tables minus a input minus I verbridge zero and so forth, I would actually create that rule in memory. I've also got some additional pieces of information here. When we do a save, it saves out right here. You can see the packet counts on the output chain. We have accepted 24 packets out of 1,686 packets that we have looked at. So we had 24 matches on this particular chain based on the rules that are in place. You can see all of the other rules that we've got here. That's really the output that we get when we do a save on IP tables. Now, in order to do a save, I probably want to be able to restore at some point. The first thing I want to do is actually flush the rules. So I'm going to flush the input chain and I'm going to flush the output chain and then I'm going to flush the forward chain. And now if I do an IP tables minus L minus V and list the rules out, I I've actually got nothing here. There are no rules that are in place now. I do, however, have the rules that are in place in the saved file that's on disk. All I need to do now is do service IP tables restart. And now if I do a listing of the rules, I've got all of my rules back. It's because I did, once I did a, a restart, it actually reloaded all of the rules that had been saved anytime the IP table starts up. So for example, at boot time, it looks for this save file and it loads the rules from there. If you ever get into a place where you have added a number of rules or maybe deleted a number of rules, all you have to do is restart the IP table service and you'll start from the last saved set of rules, which hopefully is a good set of rules and you can clean up your rules from there. SE Linux is a module or a set of utilities and some kernel modules that actually provide enhanced security for Linux. It was actually started by the NSA several years ago. And there are a number of things you need to know about SE Linux. It's actually a pretty complicated system, although there are some fundamentals that really aren't all that complicated. The first thing that we're going to talk about are actually the modes. So I'm going to take a look at the modes that are available for SE Linux. And there's really two modes that we want to worry ourselves about. We've got two modes. We've got enforcing and we've got permissive. There's also disabled, but of course, if we disable it, then there is no SE Linux and we don't have to worry about it. With enforcing mode, there's a security policy that's in place and that policy is enforced. And there's also a permissive mode, which means there's a policy that's in place, but we don't actually enforce the policy. If there are policy violations, all we do are print warnings and we don't actually enforce it. That's really good for getting your policy up and running and getting everything established before you actually turn it over to enforcing. I can also do a get enforce and I should be able to see the enforcing status and it says it is enforcing, it's not permissive. And I could also do a set enforce. 
if I wanted to set the enforce, we could say set enforce, enforcing one or zero, meaning on or off, or permissive one or zero, meaning on or off. When you've got an SE Linux security policy, if you've been running in permissive mode for a little while, then you can switch it over to be enforcing, and that provides, again, your system with a little bit better security with some mandatory access controls and role-based access controls. And we've got some additional capabilities with SE Linux for better enhancing the security of the system. More ways of getting information about SE Linux and the different contexts that are used for files and users. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to look at my directory here. I've got some files in my directory, and if I do a long listing, you can see the permissions, you can see the user and the group, you can see the size, date, and all of those things. What I'm missing here is the SE Linux context. In order to get that, I would have to do a minus capital Z. Now you can see I've actually got, in addition to the user and the group, I've got the SE Linux user and the role and then the type over here. So I've got unconfined user, an object role, and then a user home type. That's the context for this particular file here. And you can see most of them are pretty much the same other than this one here is an audio home type as opposed to a user home type. And the reason for that is because music is stored there. I can find out information about my user by doing ID minus Z. And you can see I've got an unconfined user, unconfined role, unconfined type. And I want to take a look at other logins on the system. So I'm going to use SE manage. I'm going to do a list of the logins here. SE Manage is how you manage all of the SE Linux information. You can give additional permissions to things like applications. You can open up ports to be allowed to communicate with different applications using SE Manage. There are a number of things we would use SE Manage for. This happens to be one of them. I've got a default login name with an unconfined user. And then I've got a root is my login name with an unconfined user. And then I've got a system user with a, a system user here. Now, if I want to take a look at the contexts for applications that are being run, I would do something like this, minus EZ is going to show me the process listing with the context information for these different processes. You can see, uh, let's just pick one for example, the DH client, for example, is running as a system user and a system role with a DHCPC type. And then we've got NFS version four service with a kernel T type. And then we've got the pickup service here, which belongs to Postfix, and that's the Postfix pickup type. We've got a number of different ways of looking at the contexts that belong to users and files and processes, and this is a handful of ways that you would go about doing that. You can, of course, make changes to the SE Linux contexts for files and directories, but at some point you may want to restore default settings. And so we're going to walk through how you would go about doing that, both making changes to the context as well as restoring the settings once you want them back to defaults. I'm in the root directory and I'm actually logged in as the root user. That way I don't have to use sudo. And so I'm going to do a minus L capital Z that's going to give me the contexts as well as the long listing for the files in this directory. You can see that we're at system user, object role, and admin home type for all of the files here. 
the first thing I want to do is I'm going to change the context. So I'm going to use chcon to change the context. And I'm going to make the change to the user. And I'm going to change it from system user to just user user. And I'm going to change the type to public content underscore T for type. And I'm going to make that change to the Anaconda kickstart configuration. The thing about change con though, is that if I were to reboot at this point, this context change that we have just made actually won't stay across a reboot. You can see that we're now at user underscore U and public content underscore T for the Anaconda kickstart configuration file. Now, if I wanted to make this permanent, I would have to use SE manage, which is where we actually make changes to all of the SE Linux settings. So I'm going to make a change to a file context and I'm going to change the user and I'm going to change the type and I'm going to make that change to the Anaconda kickstart configuration. Now what's happening is SE Manage is going through and not only changing the settings here, but also changing them within the SE Linux configuration. So now if I take a look at the settings, you can see that we've set them here and they're actually the way that we had set them. So it's user and public content underscore T. Now, if I want to restore to the defaults, all I have to do is run restore con and I'm going to run it on the Anaconda kickstart file. And now if I were to do an LS minus LZ, you can see that we're back to the system user and the admin home. So we have restored the contexts that were default on those files and SE Linux knows what the defaults are and is capable of actually setting those contexts back to the default. So we've gone through and we've changed context. We've made the context permanent, and then we just restored the contexts back to the default settings. SE Linux actually has a number of configuration settings and they are set using Boolean. And Boolean is a type of logic that uses zeros and ones or true or false settings. We're going to take a look at the directory where those files and those settings are actually stored. I'm going to go to slash SE Linux slash Booleans, and we're going to see all of the files, meaning all of the configuration settings that we can use with SE Linux. And if I just scroll up, we should be able to see a number of different settings and different files. And we're going to make a change here to allow SSH key sign. Actually, let's play with that one a little bit. I'm going to do set SE bool, allow SSH key sign. And I'm going to say, set that to one. Now that would be setting that to a true setting. And what I can do is get SE bool. I can do a get SE bool and I'm going to do allow SSH key sign. And that should get me the setting back. You can see that allow SSH key sign is on. Now I could also toggle it. So whatever setting it's at, I can change it to the opposite setting. Remember Boolean is either a one or a zero. So toggling it just changes from one to the other. So I'm going to toggle SE bool, allow SSH key sign. Now you can see that it's inactive, meaning it's off. So if I were to do a get SE bool allow SSH key sign, we would see that it was actually off. Now I've just changed this, but it's really a change that's not going to survive a reboot. Like 
other settings with SE Linux, you actually have to specifically say that you want to make it permanent. In order to make it permanent, I would use set SE bool minus capital P for permanent, allow SSH key sign one. Now we're going to make that change permanent in addition to making the change right here on the fly that's going to change the current session of the system. Making it permanent means that all of the settings across SE Linux get changed, so the next time that we reboot, that setting will be maintained. And I could do SE manage boolean minus M dash on allow SSH key sign. This would be another way of doing the same thing. Set SE bool allows me to do basically the same thing as this SE manage command here, where I'm setting the allow SSH key sign to on, and I am using SE manage instead of set SE bool. Now I could do a get SE bool minus A is going to give me everything. So now I can look at all of the settings and see what they're actually set to. If I do a get SE bool minus A, that gets the Boolean settings for all of the settings across the system. So now we've taken a look at the Boolean settings, we've seen how we can toggle them, and we've done some settings that are both dynamic in the sense that they only live until the reboot and we've also set them statically so that they will actually survive a reboot. At its core, SE Linux is really just a set of policies. When you have policies, you can expect policy violations. And those policy violations, since this is all about system security, those policy violations are typically where a resource or a user has done something in an unexpected fashion. So you really want to keep an eye on the policy violations. Now, we need to be able to have a way of logging those policy violations. So you need a couple of things to be running. The first thing is our syslog. And I just turned that on even though it's on by default. It is actually running. I'm just showing you how we would go about ensuring that the services that we need are running. The other one is audit D. And I could restart those using service, but I, I know they're running, so I'm not going to worry about that right now. If they aren't actually running, of course, you could do service R syslog on, and the same thing with audit D. Once we've got those on, there's a couple of places where we're actually going to see logs. The first one is I'm going to check var log messages for the pattern AVC. And there is an AVC label where there is an SE violation. So I'm going to search for AVC and we've got some AVC notices. This is just a policy load notice. The other place I can expect to see messages resulting from SE Linux is actually in the audit logs. I'm going to go to var log audit, audit d dot log or audit dot log rather. And you can see all of the logs that have resulted from the SE Linux subsystem actually logging various things. And you can see we've got the use of sudo, for example. Sudo is actually being logged here within SE Linux, so we can see that. Now, the other thing that I may want to do is run SE Alert and take a look at the browser. The SE Alert browser is actually a graphical tool that's going to show me policy violations. It's going to take a second or so to come up. And it's going to show me where I may have policy violations and I can make some changes to the 
violation alerts when they're up so I can display them. I could delete them if I wanted to. I could see what's actually happened on the system. And here you see we've got the SE Linux alert browser. And do I want to receive alerts? Yes, I want to receive alerts. And I want to do some troubleshooting. And if I had actually had a violation, this would tell me how I may be able to go about resolving that violation. In this case, I don't actually have any violations that are current. But this is how you would go about taking a look at the policy violations. You could use the SE Linux alert browser in order to look at the policy violations and do some troubleshooting and figure out how you would go about resolving the violations that actually had occurred.